Welcome everyone. My name is Jerry Hajar and I am the department chair in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering here at Northeastern University. Thank you for joining us for today's panel discussion. This is the first in a series of panel discussions featuring civil and environmental engineering faculty and members of our industrial advisory board and discussions around topics relating to civil and environmental engineering solutions addressing the current COVID-19 pandemic. Much of the work we do in our department has been focusing on urban engineering, looking at new solutions for complex urban regions. And soon after this pandemic started, many of our faculty, about half the department, quickly started addressing some of the most challenging issues facing our society, ranging from developing new testing protocols to detect the virus, testing of materials to develop effective masks, address, addressing the patterns of spreading of the virus, looking at the impact of the pandemic on pollution, looking at the impact on transportation systems and urban mobility and several other topics. Please see our website at cee.northeastern.edu for more information on our research and education programs. Members of our outstanding industrial advisory board have also been addressing issues of the pandemic and together we're pleased to present these panel discussions. Today's topic is urban mobility and the gig economy, the future of urban life and work with COVID-19. Before I introduce today's moderator, I'd like to mention a couple of logistical details. As a note to everyone, this event is being recorded. Also, we ask that everyone in the audience, please keep your microphones and video off for better streaming quality. There will be a question and answer session after the presentations and all questions that you have can go into the chat. Now I'd like to introduce today's moderator and he will introduce uh, today's panel members. Greg Janey, a proud alumnus of our program, is the president and CEO of Janey Construction Management and Consulting, a firm providing construction management services throughout the Northeast. In addition to being a member of our industrial advisory board, Mr. Janey is chairman of the board of trustees at Wentworth Institute of Technology, from which he also holds an honorary doctorate in engineering. He's a member of the board of directors of the Boston Chamber of Commerce. He's the past president for the Massachusetts Division of the Construction Management Association of America. He's a program evaluator for ABET, and he's the founding officer of the Massachusetts Minority Contractors Association. Greg, thank you very much for joining us, and I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Jerry. And uh, welcome, everyone, and good afternoon. Uh, first of all, this is really an honor to moderate the first part of a three series panel discussion on the impacts of COVID 19. Um, but over the last several months, we all have had a chance to reflect. And this pandemic has done a couple of things if it hasn't done anything else, but it's caused us to pause and rethink and reevaluate how we live, how we work, and how we play. And I think as Jerry said, today's session will focus specifically on urban mobility and the, and the gig economy, the future of life and work with COVID-19. What we've come to know as social distancing has significantly changed urban mobility and has a disproportionate impact in urban neighborhoods. Some that are dense, some that are not, but they're often linked to demographics and look forward to hearing more about that once the panel begins the discussion. Um, there's infrastructure that supports urban mobility but it also supports gig economy jobs. So what are those? Those are things like delivery, mobile services like Uber and Lyft, et cetera, care work. And they're suffering a significant workforce volatility right now because of the pandemic. And as the pandemic really increases, the delivery services have increased, but it really exacerbates the existing risk to workers and the impacts on infrastructure. We've got a panel of experts that will explore the effects of the pandemic on urban mobility, how people will interact within the urban regions, and the impact on one of our economy's newest forms of employment, gig economy. So I have the pleasure now to introduce our really prestigious panel of experts, and I am going to start with Bill Roach. Uh, so Bill Roach is an executive vice president 
and Chief Strategic Officer at BHB. Throughout his nearly 40-year career, he's maintained a successful track record leading complex land development and infrastructure projects throughout the East Coast. So please join me in welcoming Bill. Bill? Thank you, Greg. Uh, first of all, let me thank Northeastern University for providing us uh, this forum. I think it's gonna be a really interesting uh, conversation. I'm gonna start uh, with a kind of a broad overview uh, of what we think uh, and what we've seen as some of the impacts of the pandemic, particularly focused on how it's changing urban mobility and uh, the urban form. And I want to focus on, on the urban form uh, as well as not just the mobility uh, issues. So I can have the first slide there. Uh, okay, actually, uh, so we can go right to the second one. That's just an introductory, introductory slide. It's pretty clear that uh, COVID-19 has had a dramatic impact on urban mobility uh, here in the U.S. and worldwide. You have, you've seen any of the graphics that have been put forward, uh, the uh, changes in peak hour travel in major urban centers from pre-COVID uh, uh, pandemic to post-COVID pandemic is pretty dramatic. Our social circles have gotten much smaller. Uh, you know, gathering with friends and relatives has discouraged people to stay closer to home. Uh, working from home, lack of opportunity to go anywhere. Stores are shut down, restaurants uh, are shut down. Uh, flying uh, and taking public transport are considered high-risk activities. Uh, people are walking longer distances. Uh, bike use uh, and pedestrian activity is up. Uh, and bike sales, interestingly, have doubled uh, over uh, you know, pre and post uh, over this time last year. Uh, so, uh, want to go to the next slide uh, for me. Some of the numbers uh, that are uh, clear is that uh, overall travel, uh, trip making activity is down anywhere from 40 to 60 percent. Uh, recreation and travel trips, as you might guess, in North America are down about 40%. Uh, interesting uh, to note that trips to parks actually are up 10% after an early decline. And then the work trip uh, is down anywhere from uh, 60, uh, 40 to 60% uh, as our travel on public transportation reflected the fact that it's a high risk activity. Uh, next slide. Uh, the uh, Big question that I see in all of this, these changes are clear. We can track the data now. Uh, but the real question is, which of these changes are transient or temporary that are driven simply by the pandemic that might resolve themselves if and when there's a vaccine or therapeutics? And which of these are long-term structural shifts? If you think about uh, the last big black swan event being 9-11 uh, and the changes that occurred in the airline industry and how we travel by air, that's clearly become a long-term uh, change. It's with us for, for a long time. I, I suspect that some of the changes uh, that uh, have occurred in the interim are in fact going to be long-term changes. I want to explore some of those. So if we could have the next slide, please. I think the, the areas in terms of how we work, uh, where and how we live, how we shop, how we consume services, and how we play are all places where there's some uh, long-term uh, potential uh, change. For example, the pandemic has created a giant work from home experiment. Those of you who are old enough uh, to remember when flex time first came in and corporations uh, kind of adopted it during summertime, but it was never really fully accepted. The pandemic has required uh, corporate America in large part in many places around the world to actually uh, do work from home. Uh, and so this experiment of work from home and understanding how it works is actually uh, turned out to be quite successful. Uh, employees report being more productive uh, and effective, not having to endure the stress of daily uh, commuting and frequent interruptions in the inherent in the office. 
Uh, and while there are changes in the work from home uh, environment, including technology limitations and finding work-life balance and feelings of isolation, the benefits uh, are considerable and likely to carry on beyond the pandemic. So the implications to that are the work trip component of travel demand could over the long term remain depressed, potentially freeing up capacity on roadways and transit systems, allowing transportation corridors uh, to be reimagined with perhaps greater focus on other modes of transportation, most notably pedestrians and bicycles. You think about uh, you know, how hard it is now with trying to meet the demands of uh, auto uh, travel as well as bicycles, pedestrians, and loading and delivery on urban streets. Think about what would happen if we have, for the long term, 20, 25, 30% fewer commuter uh, vehicles on the road because we've got a flex time where your 40 hour work week is spread out over perhaps a two week time period uh, in, the, in the office. Um, so there's a lot of uh, opportunity to create uh, a new uh, direction in how we design our roadways. Uh, short term, uh, obviously downside for public transit is the continued fear of infection uh, and requirements for social distancing that will reduce available system capacity and potentially shift commuters back on onto uh, roads and into the auto. So one of the things we need to think about is if we're going to reap the benefits of this uh, total flexible work, work from home strategy, mobility providers are going to need, and the government are going to need to uh, make a concerted effort to, one, convince the public that taking uh, public transit is safe and that business models for public transit systems are also going to need to change. Uh, for example, perhaps tailoring schedules to meet actual demand instead of fixed schedules uh, and better integration with other micro-mobility solutions like ride hailing and uh, bike scooter sharing, uh, for example. Another outcome that affects the direction of the urban form that might be uh, interesting to explore is if we have fewer uh, commuters traveling on a daily basis into downtown for work, uh, that might actually reduce parking demands, uh, free up real estate in center cities uh, for other uses. I think multidisciplinary teams of planners, civil engineers, and technology specialists are going to be needed to help reimagine the urban core. Uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, how we live and where we live uh, is uh, also changing. It's hard to know if the early trends that we're seeing now are going to continue, but there has been a significant outmigration from major urban centers like New York, uh, mostly out of fear initially. Uh, but I think if the work from home model continues in some form, the decision on where to live becomes much more flexible. Uh, it's conceivable then that we might see renewed interests in uh, the su suburban or what we call suburban centers, so close in uh, suburbs that become mixed use, uh, uh, you know, semi urban or suburban environments uh, that provide increased amenities uh, and they maybe provide the opportunity for a hub and spoke workspace for employees that can't or don't want to work. Uh, from home, but also don't need to be in a downtown core office. So the focus on travel within the suburban environment then might become uh, walking, biking, or perhaps autonomous personal transport uh, with reduced travel between suburbs and the urban core. So there's lots of potential changes that can occur. Uh, next slide. Uh, shopping, another big uh, area, shopping and services for that matter. Uh, outside of the work trip, shopping uh, and service trips make up the majority of the remaining travel demand that we see uh, on our roadways and on our systems. Shopping activity was decisively moving to online channels prior to the pandemic, but the pandemic has served to accelerate uh, the, the demise, I will say, of, of retailers who didn't move fast enough to develop uh, an online presence. Uh, it's also accelerated new forms of shopping. I don't know if anybody has gone to the grocery store, but many of the grocers are now moving to uh, a, a form of, of shopping that's called click and collect. You go online, click your, you know, uh, the, the services uh, or the, the goods that you want. They bring them to the, the curbside and you pick them up. And 
major shopping uh, chain, center change and grocery chains that are actually moving in that direction. Uh, I don't think the personal shopping trip uh, has gone uh, completely, uh, but it has been uh, replaced in many parts by increased online delivery uh, vans uh, from countless vendors making multiple trips through neighborhoods on a daily basis and raising congestion and safety concerns and prompting the need for route optimization strategies and driver awareness trainings. So these are things that are all happening now and, and firms are starting to look very seriously at, at that. Similarly, uh, services that we consume, uh, probably the biggest example that I can see right now is in telemedicine. Uh, how many times have you gone to a doctor for a follow-up uh, that could be done or online. Doctors were, were uh, slow uh, when it first was introduced to take, a, take it up, but it has now become the norm. Uh, I don't think you'll see many doctors having you come into the office to go over your uh, labs or blood work when it can be done online uh, and your, your blood work for that matter can be done at a CVS uh, pharmacy transmitted to the uh, uh, doctor's office and you stay at home and, and the doctor uh, and you connect uh, in the Zoom meeting similar to this. So the effect on, on travel for those kinds of, of services is going to be, I think, uh, significant. Uh, the efficiency and effectiveness of that uh, is, is pretty clear and it's now uh, taken hold. Uh, Finally, you know, how we play, uh, this is really interesting. Uh, you know, we all know about the restaurant uh, business and, and the difficult times uh, that uh, business owners are going through uh, right now. Uh, in the short run, we know they're gonna have to rethink their business uh, models to remain profitable prior to having a vaccine. And the best operators will figure it out and will survive. In the long term, I think we're social animals and the desire will be to gather with family and friends in a variety of social settings. How those settings are designed uh, will depend on our success in treating the disease and instilling confidence that it's safe to gather. But the implications are uh, significant uh, in either case, the potential for natural uh, open space and less dense environments is clear. Uh, the challenge will be in designing those spaces that make patrons feel comfortable and are still economically viable. So where does that leave us? I think one of the things that we're talking about here is what does this mean to civil engineers and planners? And I think it's really uh, going to be an important time uh, for our profession. The role of civil engineers and planners is going to be significant, expanding and strengthening our communications network, clearly with more work from home and more remote learning and more uh, you know, uh, telemedicine and things of that nature, we're gonna need a much more robust uh, communications network. I think 5G has to happen in, in a big way. Getting it to all parts of, of uh, the uh, country is critical, rural uh, uh, as well as urban areas. Uh, redesigning transportation systems to accommodate the changing travel demands. Whatever changes occur and that are, uh, are really uh, structural, there is going to be a need for civil engineers to help think through how those roads uh, and transportation networks and transportation systems are redesigned to take uh, advantage of those changes and meet the demands that are going to be placed on them in the future. Uh, an area of uh, interest to myself and our firm is an advancing autonomous uh, vehicle, connected vehicle technologies, because we think that that's where uh, personal transportation may be headed. Rethinking public transportation systems is going to be critical uh, and figuring out how to change the operating model so that we're not worrying so much about crush loads and peak hour capacity and really trying to be flexible in meeting demand. Uh, multidisciplinary teams to uh, implement smart cities, uh, replanning and planning new uh, suburban villages, and then using big data and data analytics to create a new generation of real-time predictive models that will help us do all of the above. Those are just a few of the things that I see civil engineers and planners uh, being involved with as we move forward. Uh, so that's my take on it. I think it's an exciting time and uh, look forward to seeing how the industry responds.
Well, thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Bill. Um, very informative. That's a lot and leaves a lot to all of our thinking. Um, I heard a couple of things, short and long-term solutions, and I'm sure you'll hear some questions about that later. Something else that stuck out was this multidiscipline approach to how we might live and work. Um, very, very interesting. And, and some of the conversations later might dovetail into that. So look forward to some questions about that. Um, our next speaker um, is Professor Ryan Wang. Um, Ryan Wang is an expert in urban and social resilience and natural disaster response. Through recent federal grants, he's analyzing changing mobility patterns caused by the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, Ryan? Thank you very much, Greg. Um, and um, it's really a great pleasure to be here to join the discussion um, and um, you know, learn more uh, from the panel. Like Greg said, my lab has been really studying um, human and urban mobility uh, for the last five years. And for the last four months, uh, we have been focusing on understanding how uh, human mobility is changed and what are the implications on human lives in the United States. Um, uh, David, if you can share the uh, slides. So um, for this talk, um, I want to focus on human mobility and the um, um, social discounting. The reason we call it social discounting, or it, which is, you know, uh, uh, include all this, uh, the mobility and how it's impact. Because really what we are doing, uh, we call it social discounting instead of a social distancing, because what we have been doing is that reducing our mobility and keep our physical distances. Uh, but the changes have really profound social consequences. As Bill just said, right, um, it actually shrinks our social circles and reduces our uh, social capitals. Um, so to start, I want to uh, uh, start with how the mobility changes. For the next slides, um, you know, we have been doing, uh, using uh, mobility data. Actually, we have been using uh, uh, data collected from 30 million smartphones across the United States. The data supports uh, exactly what Bill just said, right? People are reducing their mobilities and it changes how cities function. Uh, for the next slide, I want, you know, uh, we, we, we observe this pattern in the entire United States, but I want to uh, especially draw the attention to, uh, to New York City, to Manhattan area. And, you know, this supports what Bill said, you know, how the urban settings, the, ur the city's function can be different. Um, we all are very familiar with Manhattan, and uh, as shows here, it is like one of the most, you know, crowded city in the entire world before the pandemics. Each day, more than 3 million people actually commuting to uh, uh, Manhattan area uh, uh, for their jobs. And also every day, you know, people around the world visit there for business or vacation purposes. Uh, but on the next slide, you will see that how the pandemic, COVID-19, has changed that. So on the left side, uh, it should, the, the, the map blown, here we actually show that, you know, where it's, it's blown, expanding more, means more people are visiting there. This is the day, on, it, this is at 3 p.m. Uh, at Friday, on Friday, January 10th, that's before the pandemic started. And you can see that, um, at that time, a lot of people visiting uh, the Manhattan area and then the area just expanded. However, after four months, and that is actually two months after uh, the declaration of national emergency, which is three, same time, 3 p.m. on May 22nd, uh, same Friday. And you can see the city withered, um, um, uh, meaning that a lot less people are at the Manhattan area are visiting the place. Uh, in fact, based on our data, we saw that the visitation reduced to only one fourth before the pandemic. And that just shows how much this pandemic has, you know, quantitatively shows how much the pandemic has changed the urban mobility, uh, changed our daily lives as well. With this, with the next question, uh, 
I want to ask is that we are trying to understand is how do people change their mobility? Um, so for next slide, um, we actually see that, uh, so we try to understand not just in Manhattan area, but across the United States, how people change the mobility. And uh, um, uh, in the next slide, you can see that across 50 uh, states in the United States, we actually uh, basically laid it over uh, across the United States map. Uh, the change can be described using two factors or you know, parameters in our study. One is the discounting which is, you know, one pandemic hit us, how people change their distance, how people change their mobility. Um, and you can see that across all the, uh, all the figures, uh, the mobility in this slide, I show mobility into each state and it's reduced significantly um, uh, to a very low level. But then the second parameter is recovery. We see that around after April, around April 5th, the, uh, there's a recovery trend and it's slowly going back uh, to what it happened uh, to what what we have before but still far from turning back to normal so you know on the so here like I said here I shows that the mobility uh, uh, flow into each state but we we observe the same thing for mobility uh, flow outside each state for mobility you know within the communities within uh, different states. We also observe the almost same pattern for percentage of time spent at work, percentage of time going outside, and the distance traveled by people across the United States. So this almost shows a um, very universal pattern here. However, like I, like I said, there are two factors. These two factors are universal, but their magnitudes are quite different, meaning that we observe very different patterns for different people. So the next question, which I specified in the next slide, is that, you know, who are more impacted? Which population are more impacted? And we, uh, you know, uh, the next slide uh, provides some uh, insight into this. Um, we break down, we rank people on the X, X, uh, uh, axis. We rank people from uh, less wealthy, uh, they are actually from less wealthy neighborhood to more wealthy neighborhood. And then you can see that uh, one people has more wealth, uh, or pe for people from more wealthy neighborhood, they are actually more cautious. They reduce their uh, uh, mobility faster than people from less wealthy neighborhood. Um, it shows that it aligns what we say, uh, what we, uh, what New York Times um, uh, specified. Basically, people from more wealthy neighborhood have the social capital to reduce their mobility much faster than people from less wealthy neighborhood. And on the next slide, we'll see that they are the same group that can afford to experience a slower recovery. They can they have better resources to stay at home, to work at home, to, um, to not, does not need to return back to their jobs and extreme more risks uh, to, um, uh, to, uh, to, to resume their life, but to population from more wealthy neighborhood, they recover much, much faster, much, much slower. Um, that has very strong uh, social implication uh, because uh, like uh, Professor Robert Sampson uh, from Harvard University said, uh, when disaster strikes, the survivals are sociable. Really what we need social, uh, we need uh, social capitals to survive the disasters. And those social capitals have been uh, disproportionately allocated to uh, people from more wealthy neighborhood. Um, so that's basically what we have been observing so far. I look forward to a discussion with the panel and with all the audience. Thank you, Professor Wang. Um, again, very, very informative. Uh, and I think what it tells us is that not only as engineers and civil engineers and scientists, that we have a social responsibility to figure out how this is going to work. And the only way we do that is to work collectively and together and not just use our true compasses, but our moral compasses on how to come to a long-term resolution. So thank you very much. Uh, very informative. And again, hopefully uh, we're going to hear a lot of questions to stimulate that, that subject. Uh, our next prestigious panelist uh, is Charles Russo. 
Charles Russo is the CEO of Simpson, Guppert, and Hager. A, um, Charlie's is responsible for the strategic direction and overall management of the firm's performance. Passionate leader, he works to articulate and shape and inspire corporate culture through storytelling and by building relationships through the organization. Uh, please join me, of course, in bringing Charles to the panel. Thank you, Greg. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us today, and I appreciate Northeastern providing the opportunity to share some insight with you. Uh, I think the panel's done a great job. Bill gave you a nice broad perspective of what's going on in the industry. Ryan was able to bring in some data in the socioeconomic aspect, that perspective to what we're dealing with. I'm going to add one more layer for us. I'm going to add a layer in our context today, focusing on our professional engineering talent in the light of and context of urban mobility, gig economy, and COVID-19. So there's two things I want to focus us on while we have a little bit of time during the introduction. Uh, the first one is on the challenge to apprentice-style learning, and the second one is going to be on the allure of a talent economy. Spend a little bit of time on each of them. On the topic of the challenge to apprenticeship-style learning, I think we'll all agree that our profession, the engineering profession, is one in which knowledge that we gain through education, training, and experience is applied with judgment. It's not a commodity, right? And as a profession, ours is one that embraces lifelong learning. So in that context, we have to ask ourselves, how is it that we can continuously produce excellent seasoned professional engineers to carry our firms forward and to carry our industry forward? I'm a strong believer that apprenticeship style learning is the key to that development. This style of learning transforms eager college graduates to seasoned professional engineers, but it requires an immersion into an engineering community that's rich with talent and rich with connectivity. I think we all recognize great coaching and great mentoring happen naturally in the moment. They're not planned events incrementally through the year. It's the here and the now. So with that, under our current circumstances, we have a highly infectious virus that spreads person to person in close contact. And that's directly at odds with our urban infrastructure, which has a baseline characteristic of densification. So examples are, think of our modes of mobility, think of our commercial occupancy. So as Bill mentioned earlier, right now, the vast majority of us, we're working from home. And we're doing that because we have to play our role as a member of society to mitigate con contracting and spreading this virus. But working from home, aside from the business aspects, Working from home really poses a significant challenge to the professional development environment that really creates these future leaders for us. And the focus of this group right now is really our entry to five-year engineers and our five to eight-year engineers. They're no longer together. They're no longer with seasoned, experienced engineers learning and questioning. The curiosity needs to be there. So two quick questions that came up very early for us when we entered this work from home environment, and I'm sure they're the same for many of you. First question, how do you keep your younger engineers engaged and curious um, for continued learning and advance their overall professional development when they're mostly functioning in sort of a kind of transactional mode, remote away from everybody else? How do you keep them connected and part of the culture and engaged? And more relevant is, especially for the students that are on the, the Zoom right now, you know, how do you onboard with a new firm where you learn about the firm and gain their culture? So there's, there's really here and now and future considerations of this, the here and now that we're dealing with in COVID for our young staff and their professional development is when we're sitting in a place where we work from home, how do you keep them engaged? How do you continue that continuous learning that they need to advance their careers? The here and now also plays into, we can deal with reduced occupancies in offices. We can re deal with physical distancing requirements. They're just challenges. We're engineers, we can overcome them. But the difficulty we have right now is as humans, coming over the perception of what is safe mobility to urban locations so that we can once again be back together in a safe way, but in a way that lets us cultivate the development that we need for, for our talent. The second piece of talent, and this one's maybe scarier uh, when you think about it, because this has significant implications in the here and now, and that's the allure of a talent economy. So Bill mentioned a little bit in his presentation, but traditional office workplace, it's been under pressure for many years now. The desire, and in some cases, the true need 
for our staff to have a more flexible, fluid work week, to have remote options to work. They challenge the brick and mortar establishment of a Monday through Friday, eight to five workplace. And I really believe that COVID-19 is gonna be that shot of adrenaline that really puts a surge in a talent economy. So take a little step back for a minute. When we, when we think about these two, let's make a distinction. There's a gig economy, which I think we all have a good grasp on. This accumulation of independent self-employed workers, but they're connected to a platform. And that, that platform, has a consumer on one side, it has an on-demand service need, and it's a transactional service to this particular gig worker. So the platform is the differentiator. Do you like Uber, do you like Lyft, right? But not necessarily the individual themselves that provides the service, it's more of a commodity. But when we refer to talent economy, it's really a piece of that overall gig economy, and it's the accumulation of us. It's the accumulation of freelance, independent, highly skilled and experienced professional consultants. They're often called gig consultants. And here, the talent is really the differentiator. And the platform is just simply an, enab an enabler. So in our current engineering talent pool, who may see the allure of this talent economy? I'll challenge you to think of two groups right away because they're the two that I think of. First one, that highly valuable 10 to 15 year engineer. Some may call it the unicorn in our profession because many of these individuals don't exist because they left us or never entered during the previous recession. So there's already a scarcity of these individuals and we hold them precious for those that are in our current firms. Many of them really desire an agile workplace and a flexible work schedule, more so than companies can normally provide. But as one of these freelancers in a talent economy, they control their own destiny. They already have the experience, the experience to be highly valuable. Now they're gonna put it to work. So these are individuals right now that are very desirable in the, in the industry and quite honestly may find this talent, the talent economy, the allure they needed to kick them over. And that, that's, that's scary for us. Uh, the second one, or that population of our engineering talent that are near retirement. They have in 35, 40 plus years of experience. They're invaluable within your office to share knowledge, to lead, to educate, to be part of that apprenticeship style. They may look around right now and see gig consulting, or as they would often be in these, a gig advisor, as sort of a soft landing or soft transition from full-time employment to full retirement. And there are many firms right now that would love to have access to 35, 40 years of education, training, and experience to help them boost what they have to do in their own, in their own firm. So with respect to the talent economy, I think you have one of two positions that you're sitting and looking at this. The first one is a positive perspective which is this talent economy really could give engineering firms access to vital engineering talent that they otherwise could not obtain through traditional acquisition sources. And they couldn't develop internally in any reasonable amount of time to respond to the ever-changing business environments that we find ourselves in. If you choose to look at the negative, and I think you need to look at both, from a negative perspective, this allure of a talent economy could really strip your firm from vital engineering talent that you cultivated for years, that you envisioned to be the future leadership of your firm, and you watch it walk out the door because talent is mobile. So those are two things I wanted to challenge us to think about today, uh, and I'll pass it back over to Greg. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I probably have 19 questions about that. I think most of us that are participating in this uh, have firms ourselves, and so that's a very interesting subject about strategies, new employment strategies, um, but I would submit that they are all connected in these various presentations. So thank you very much for uh, that presentation. So finally, uh, we have our final panelist, um, Michael Kane, Professor Michael Kane, who is an expert in the human in the loop control of civil infrastructure. I hope I said that right. Yeah. Uh, building on a common federal grant of the future of work, he's investigating the ways in which COVID-19 is impacting the algorithmic workplace. Uh, please, Michael, go ahead and step up and, and proceed. Thank you. Uh, David, can we get the slides? Uh, so I'm excited to, to, to hear from everyone, and I, I think that this presentation I should kind of wrap up part of the infrastructure, part of the gig economy, um, and, and what that means for us in the in our future of how the algorithm will play a big role in the future of civil infrastructure. 
Uh, next slide. So the, the infrastructure is adapting faster than ever. And it's not just because of changing demand, uh, but because we have new tools. We're more connected and we can predict demand better than we ever could before. Next slide. Uh, so you might be familiar with, uh, oh, I guess we're a little delay on the next slide there. There we go. So, yeah, so this is probably how you're familiar with uh, adapting infrastructure. So we can change which directions the lanes go with zippers. Uh, we can change which uh, direction demand goes. We can, we can change tolls on different routes in order to, to, to kind of uh, to, to control demand. Or we can make routes more safer. We can open up uh, side lanes or close them down. So we're adjusting both system capacity, which is what we're used to as civil engineers, but more and more we're adjusting system demand uh, through incentives and, and other uh, aspects. So the next slide really shows us how COVID is also uh, kind of uh, taking advantage of this adaptability of civil infrastructure. It's not just a concrete road that we pave and we keep there for a hundred years. It's something that we can quickly change. We can put some signs down in order to share the streets uh, more with pedestrians and cyclists and families that are now using. We can completely repurpose part of the street, not for mobility, but for retail and, and, and for, for restaurants, just with some paint and some cones. And as uh, signaling, routing, payments are becoming more interconnected, this will increase the ubiquity of algorithms in to be able to control our infrastructure. For example, the MTA has proposed using Ticketmaster type technology for train and bus reservations. How can we as a profession prevent everyone from hating mass transit as much as we hate Ticketmaster? Uh, so on to the next slide shows how we can kind of use inspiration from the gig economy. The gig economy is thriving because it can adapt fast. The, the mantra of Silicon Valley is to move fast and break things. Uh, so the next slide or the ne next part of this slide is showing how moving fast and breaking things means different for a private company, Uber, Lyft, they're private companies. They're not free markets, they're not public servants. So if we're gonna borrow those algorithms, how can we provide public service so that we don't have workers sleeping in cars, that we uh, don't kind of take advantage of and, and pay workers way lower than they, they deserve or that they can live off of. And that their pay is predictable, that the, the algorithm is providing not just a service, but a, a predictable service that doesn't cause undue stress um, on, on the workforce. So on the next slide, well, uh, so over the last couple of months, uh, funded by Northeastern and uh, the National Science Foundation, um, in collaboration with a, a, a great interdisciplinary team of, of law, work social scientists, and other uh, engineers, we've been studying delivery companies, where we've been studying online forums where these workers communicate, and we've been interviewing workers themselves. And these are all tools that civil engineers, I believe, are going to have to start adapting into their traditional way of designing infrastructure, especially large-scale planning. So to, let's look into this algorithm that uh, this, this delivery company uses. It minimizes the miles driven by their workforce, which is essentially maximizing their profit. But if we look at the human side of that algorithm, the 20% of workers in that workforce are working 80% of the total hours of, for that company. These workers' lives, these full-time workers' lives depend upon that company. However, that company focuses on the other 80% of workers that are only working 20% of the hours, but those 20% of the hours are peak capacity hours. So just like in civil engineer, we design for peak capacity, but as things become more algorithmic, our capacity is dynamic. And so we have to think about this 80-20 balance between people that depend upon our uh, platform and the 20% the of people that our platform depends upon. We scraped over 6 million messages from an online forum and found that people are adapting uh, through this gig economy between mobility and delivery applications. We interviewed some of these workers and found that there's a significant information asymmetry across this workforce and between the workforce and the platforms. It really raises questions about how workers can band together to share information and improve their well-being. And we can kind of uh, control F and replace every time I said worker with passenger if we're thinking about applying this to mass transit. So if we go to the next slide, we can look about how this sort of platform um, works for the future of civil infrastructure. So how could mass transit uh, adapt the um, agility of the gig economy while still providing an equitable public service? We need to understand the human side. 
Does it serve the 80% of people who can go online and don't depend upon the mass transit for their livelihood? Or does it serve the 20% of people in retail and healthcare that really depend upon the mass transit, but might not be paying the total bills? As mass transit becomes more algorithmic, how does it understand the users? How do users understand the algorithm? And do users try to cheat the algorithm? Or even worse, does the algorithm try to cheat the users? Algorithms uh, empower users with the freedom to make decisions, but it also transfers risk in that transfer of freedom. And so if we click on to the next slide, we see that it's not just monetary risk, it's legal risk, it's psychological risk, it's health risk that these new workers are being burdened with. And so we've been talking primarily about mobility and delivery as our gig economy. But as Charles pointed out, it's not just these unskilled uh, workers. If we go to the next slide, we can see that it's professional workers, it's skilled workers. And really, even on the next slide, it's creative work. So architects, it's professional work, it's engineers. Those are the folks that uh, Charles was talking about. 50% of people in the gig economy are working these sort of professional jobs. So as the engineers in the audience, um, how do engineers that are working their way up uh, through the ranks benefit from great gig work? Those questions that Charlie was asking. And I think that we have to look at both the positive and negatives. And at, we as leaders in civil engineering firms and as in the civil engineering uh, workforce, how do we make sure that we don't take advantage of vulnerable or precarious individuals? And how do we uh, arbitrate this trust? How do we arbitrate this value of the talent the workers are bringing? What is um, in the sense of uh, the gig economy for professional civil engineers? And on the last slide, I'd just like to say thank you. And uh, depending on whether this, yeah, this animation will show kind of the zeitgeist uh, over the last couple of years of uh, the gig economy workforce on this platform that we scraped these 6 million posts on. So thank you so much for this opportunity. Looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Much appreciated. And again, these, these words are popping out um, to me at least, and again, you'll look forward to questions, but what I'm hearing is these, the tools that you're thinking about using will not only address the tangible items, but will address well-being mm -hmm. and making sure that um, behavior and well-being and all these other soft tools uh, are used, and it's, it's uh, good to hear that. Um, so what I'd like to do, and I'd like to thank you all, um, what I'd like to do is, is put forward a couple of questions before I toss to Eva, because I think everything and every panel and every discussion are really interdependent. It's interesting how the words like multidiscipline uh, and those are really going to play a hard role. So I'm going to toss the first one to uh, Michael and Charles, I think, uh, because very interested in this gig economy and this new employment strategy. and uh, what comes to my mind is culture. Uh, what are some of the downsides of gig economy? And share some of your thoughts about how do you retain culture in, uh, in gig economy? If you're going to figure out how to hire people, I think you mentioned, Charles, how you can take advantage, if you would, about some of the retirement community. How do you preserve culture? How do you build culture? Sure, it, it, that's one of the most difficult aspects of looking at the gig economy or talent economy with respect to our professional engineering firms. Right? We're, we're a firm where individuals take great pride in the profession. They come out of school, they typically join a firm and have stayed for a firm with the firm for a long period of their career. Um, over the last, say, 10 years, you've seen more of a trend where younger graduates may view their first job as just that, a three to five year stay. They're going to get experience, get registered, and then figure out where they want to pursue the remainder of their career. Hopefully it's with the same firm, but they're very, very mobile and willing to be mobile in their career. So that's sort of a different piece of the population, but with the ones right now that I think are susceptible to the gig economy, uh, that 10 to 15 year sort of engineer that I was describing, you know, that, that individual has all of the talent necessary that they could go out and open their own firm. They really do. So from, a, from our perspective, right, as a firm, how do you make sure those individuals recognize that they are highly valued, recognize that they are both a teacher and a learner throughout the re remainder of their career by staying at a firm that, again, is rich in talent and connectivity, and that shows them what great opportunities they, opportunities they have moving forward to continue their career in this mode 
rather than take it as a, as a freelance independent. So I think right now that's one of the challenges with the 10 to 15. And with, with the near requirement, I think from that perspective, it, it really does come down to the individual and their colleagues recognizing the true value they bring, the esteem that they have within that firm. Right? They, they walk around because they've helped make the firm successful as it is today. They've been here for 35, 40 years, and you have to treat them with that respect and that dignity and, and find ways for them to still feel like they are engaged and contributing every day, even if that means they only want to come in for one or two days a week. You have to find a way to make sure everybody feels engaged, active, contributing, and they want to continue. Thank you. Very helpful. Michael, you want to add to that? Yeah, I'll add on. So the gig economy of uh, unskilled labor and uh, skilled labor are very different, but they, they share some kind of common nuggets. And I, the, the, the talent economy, as, as Charles has put it, uh, so there, there's platforms out there. So it's not the, it's not the same as the consultant that works part-time that we may have thought of 10 years ago for an engineering firm where there's personal relationships that are built. You met the, the, the guy on the golf course, and so you figure out how to write a contract so that he, he works a, a couple hours um, a week. I think that the, the future is, is going to be platform driven. Uh, so there will be these platforms like Upwork is kind of one of the most popular kind of part-time work ones now, especially for the creative economy um, or creative talent as opposed to not, not so much professional talent. Um, but so this, this, this platform serves as this arbitrator of trust and talent between uh, the supply, the workers and, and the companies. Um, and what we we see in the the, the non-talented community or the, the unskilled uh, uh, workforce that I think will transfer over to uh, the skilled workforce is that the platform nor the uh, employer are the source of community for these individuals. The source of community for these individuals are online forums are converse, uh, having conversations in, uh, so they might be working remotely, but they might not be working in their home. They might be working in a shared office space. So they might be building community uh, through those platforms. They might be getting their mentoring from someone else that is doing civil engineering work, not for the same company, but just happens to be working in the same shared workspace or the same online Slack channel or, or Facebook group. Um, so I think that there's some really interesting opportunities for per perhaps university alumni associations or uh, the American Society of Civil Engineers to, to kind of create these platforms uh, to build community um, amongst these new uh, workers that might not be so attached to the community of any particular company because they might be working for multiple companies at a time or working between companies as, as demand shifts and, and different projects um, are at different companies. Thank you. I, I'd like to be respectful for time. Uh, and by the way, we are gonna open the floor up uh, for questions once I provide an introduction to Eva. So one more question, if you folks can just provide an example, and this is to Bill and Brian, uh, specifically about this short and long-term approach to solution. If, if you each could just provide a, a brief example of what we should look forward to for long-term solution, very interested in that. Um, I'll, I'll take a shot at that, Greg, uh, first. I mean, I think this whole discussion has been really interesting and the way I view the current pandemic has really been an accelerant uh, for change that was coming, uh, albeit much more slowly uh, than uh, it might have been hoped to. Uh, so I, I think looking forward, you know, long-term change, uh, you know, I, I think mobility patterns are going to change and, and relating back to what Charles and, and Michael just said, I think it's going to be incumbent on uh, companies to uh, in the long term, figure out if they want to maintain themselves as a, you know, uh, a generational company that uh, creates a culture that where people want to come and work and be part of, uh, echoing what Charles uh, said, I think we're going to have to uh, figure out how to be more flexible, how to allow uh, employees to have the, the, uh, the benefit of working from home and at the same time, uh, providing them the kind of uh, mentoring, uh, relationship development, and uh, culture that uh, they crave, particularly in the formative years as uh, as young engineers. I think 
uh, being one of those guys that Charlie referred to as the 30 to 40 year guy who's trying to figure out how to retire successfully. Uh, I, you know, I think it's, it really is important uh, to feel engaged. Uh, and so I think companies in the long term uh, I have to figure out how to hold on to that, uh, those jewels, because not that I'm referring to myself as a jewel, but those, uh, those uh, you know, uh, employees who have uh, built up 40 years, 35 years, 25 years of, of really valuable experience uh, can, while they're not necessarily lead projects, uh, they certainly can help the next leaders of projects you know, avoid pitfalls. And I think that's what we need to look forward to uh, going forward as a, uh, as a, uh, a profession. All right, thank you. Uh, Professor Wang, I hate to squeeze you into a minute, but was very interested in hearing about the socioeconomic sort of uh, uh, disparity between what happens with folks who are, uh, are well-serviced and those that are not. And so long-term, what are your thoughts about the solution towards that, towards bridging that gap? Um, I, I think I agree with what uh, Bill and um, um, everyone said, right? The, um, for the longer term solution, we already see some companies allow their workers to uh, work at home until the end of this year, like uh, uh, Facebook or Google. But then for the other, um, you know, other companies are actually thinking for this as a, as a permanent strategy for their workers as well. Um, and then also, you know, it's, it's, it's about the, the perception and the mentality uh, from the, for the companies and for the workers before they don't really think this is a viable solution. But now the pandemic forced them and they actually opened their eyes to see this could work. But exactly like you said, Greg, I think um, we, we want to, we, when we are saying this could be permanent, we we want to make sure this is also fair for all the populations as well. There are people um, from neighborhoods that cannot afford to work at home. There are people actually more new, uh, new workers for gig economy to help pick up grocery, for example, for, for people from wealthy neighborhoods that we don't want to take this risk. How do we protect them? How do we uh, shaped our policy and incentives to protect them for the longer term. I think that's something uh, the engineers need to think about, uh, the engineers need to think about and contribute. All right, well, thank you very much. Um, great, great information. I need to introduce Eva Rosen, who is the newest member in the Office of Development and Alumni Affairs in the College of Engineering. She joined Northeastern in October as a director of Major Gifts. Eva? Hi, I'm just, um, sorry, wrong button. Uh, we have a question in the chat. Uh, thanks very much for that, Greg. Um, so uh, the question is, as we see uh, COVID-19 cases grow, um, won't this push back any progress uh, we've made in terms of mobility and the gig economy? Um, and I, I don't know who wants to take a stab at it, but maybe Mike, would you, um, would you like to take a stab? Oh, Charlie, okay, thank you, Charlie. I, I can go after Michael, that's fine. <laughs> No, go uh, ahead. So, yeah, yeah, Charlie, oh, why don't you go ahead? Yeah. Okay, so it, great question. So here's, here's one of the issues that you know, we're, de we're dealing with and seeing right now. So you, we have growth in many of the locations and in infections where we have offices. Uh, some schools have already announced that they're not going to open come the fall. Uh, many are speculating that they won't even open come the second half of their academic year, meaning the January timeframe. So we have many staff right now who, because of circumstances related to COVID, uh, they're not able to meet a 40 hour week commitment. They have other, other commitments that they need to handle and that's most likely related to uh, healthcare, childcare, now remote learning for school. So I think that, I mean, the opposite of the way the question was framed, I think the continued extension of the way we're in right now from COVID is actually more enticing from a talent economy standpoint because of if I'm someone who has 15 years of experience and I know I'm highly valued in the marketplace, but because of other commitments and what's going on with COVID, I can really only commit 20 to 24 hours a week. Um, I can be highly sought after for many firms for my talent and expertise. I'm a plug and play right in somebody's firm and they'll be compensated based on the value that they bring. So I'm sure they won't be made whole by becoming a gig consultant. Uh, they'll, they'll make out pretty well compared to the amount of time that they necessarily would have had to put in. 
So I think the longer this stays in its current stall mode while we are safer at home uh, and more is going on, I think that may encourage individuals to really start thinking about, might this be an opportunity for me? Might this be some way for me to get through the next 12 to 18 months and explore, right? Explore what might be going on. I'll just add, add a, a final note on that, that yeah. uh, the, the gig economy is agile. Um, and so just as it's uh, in, in the, the unskilled uh, economy, we're seeing Uber drivers move over to uh, grocery delivery. And if uh, the mobility becomes more profitable um, and, and it starts, uh, the demand starts picking up there, we'll see probably uh, that that workforce driving back and as unemployment is so high these this gig economy really made uh, headway in the aftermath of the 2008 downturn um, so just uh, at, because so many people are unemployed um, that will really kind of continue to see uh, the unskilled gig economy flourish and I think because of the points that Charles has brought up we'll really see the uh, talented uh, gig economy uh, flourish too. I just want to add the kind of one little little warning there for our for not not so the warnings is uh, think about your unpaid hours as a gig worker. Um, the Uber driver has to think about the unpaid hours sitting in the airport parking lot waiting for a ride. Uh, the skilled worker has to think about manicuring their online profile in order to really show off their talents, in order to, uh, to build these relationships. Not all of those are part of the paid contract. Um, so yeah. Thanks so much. Um, Jerry, I think we're at time or past time. Uh, I think it's time for you to wrap up, yes? <laughs> thank you. Yes, I think so. And uh, thank you very much uh, to our moderator, Greg Janey and to all of our speakers uh, for their excellent presentations and for the discussion. These are certainly challenging times, but I am heart heartened to see the hard work in civil and environmental engineering to study and develop solutions towards these issues. So in closing, I'd like to thank all of you for joining today. I'd especially like to thank any of you out there who are alumni or students. Really appreciate you coming back to Northeastern virtually here. Please join us for our next panel discussions. Uh, we have one coming up on the future of transportation resilience on July 29th at 12 noon, and uh, one on environmental health in a pandemic on August 12th at 12 noon. We hope to see you there. And uh, thanks again, everybody. We will see you later. Bye-bye.